welcome to the College of Complexes, a very exciting uh, event that happens every Saturday from 6 o'clock on. What we have are a couple of rules, two simple rules. Does anybody know what those rules are? No, one fool at a time. One fool at a time and no personal insults, okay? Uh, tonight we are here to, uh, to hear what a movement means to A.J. Signeri, uh, who is here to tell us all about it. Uh, he's for a collective effort rather than an A.J. Come on up here. A.J. has spoken before uh, this body. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm glad I'm back here at the College of Complex. This is my third time doing this, so I appreciate this um, forum of having free speech um, and this playground of ideas, if it were. Um, we need more of these. And I know there's one in Texas, that's the College of Complexes, um, but there needs to be more, I really feel. So thank you for, I think Charlie, I don't know if you're one of the founders, but Charlie and others who've been doing this for a long time, and keeping it, thank you. I, I think we should applaud you for that. Speak um, more directly into the mic. Speak directly into the mic? Yeah, All because right. you're, you're, you're not loud enough. I'm going to try, thank you. So, so it's not really a question of if I'm for or against collective movement or insular movement. Um, the, the question of, you know, why social movements <clears throat> even exist and what is there a better approach? Is it a collective movement or is it more so an insular movement? I'll talk about those two here in a minute. And the future of social movements. Um, social movements is one of those things that has been around for centuries. We read about history, we hear about all these kind of movements in Greece and Rome and Egypt, the Middle East and Asia and North America. We hear of movements all the time. However, I'm of the opinion that people use the word movement too loosely, like they use the word occupy or even radical or cooperative. It's too loose. People use it synonymously for a lot of things. The professor, um, Charles Till, who wrote this book, Social Movements, and he goes from 1768 to about 2004. He passed away in 2008, so he couldn't tell you the extended version of social movements. He says that social movements, in essence, is an inclusive organization comprised of various interests of groups. That's the simplest terms that Tilly presents of what social movement means. But there's more theory behind social movements, and I can talk about social movements for a semester worth of sociology graduate level, but we don't have that much time. So to comprise six months into these few minutes, Social movements for me is not only what Tilly said, but it's also what Robert Merton said when he talks about a strain theory. Now, this is anyone can come up here afterward. Look at this. Um, this theory, the strain theory or anomaly theory that Merton presents, who was a professor at the University of Chicago who passed away very few years back. This even though it talks about deviance. This model talks about how all of us in society changes daily, monthly, quarterly, yearly. And the very corner up here that some of us are very okay. We're conformed to our institutional and cultural needs. There's some of us who actually want to retreat either institutional or the cultural needs because we do not agree with those. And for some of us, like myself, are in this separate box called rebellion. Creating a whole new institutions and whole new cultural means to change 
society. So this is one theory among others. So social change means political with a small p, and by that I mean it's personal. Every single one of us is political. That table right there with ban fracking, CTA, Green Party, Socialist Party, that's all of us. That's political for us. That's personal for us. So even though, yes, I'm a member of the Socialist Party of Chicago Local, I'm also with the Green Party, I'm also with Ban Fracking, I'm also with Occupy, I'm also with a whole slew of other things. So I'm not just one person with one identity. All of us here are multidimensional. And because of that, all of us are involved in certain movements. But what is the gain and purpose of getting involved in these movements. My friend Scott Crow, who wrote the book Black Flags and Windmills, and founded the Common Ground Collective in New Orleans after Katrina, he says there's three kinds of power. There's one, the first one is we as people or groups that assume they have power. So they just talk and get involved with things and they assume they have the power. There's power with a capital P, which means government, institutions, things of that nature. And then power with a small p, which is the most important one because power with a small p means that is organic, that's grassroots. And that's what all of us strive for in social movements. That's what some of us strive for in Occupy, was to gain that kind of power, that kind of influence at the ground level. The scholar Robert Dahl also said in his book, Democracy, that's the other thing that we strive for when we are involved in social movements or starting a social movement is to get democracy. And democracy means simply to aim towards a goal. Some people's goal is to get someone to Congress. Some people's goal is to get truly elected to mayor. Some people's goal is to dismantle the Federal Reserve. Whatever that goal is, we have a personal goal, that political goal. That's the very core of us. And it's not just all this, but it can be in our personal lives. We want to change how Rotary International wants to be treating others, or Chamber of Commerce, because we're all involved in various things. Some of us want to change the culture, organization of our churches. Whatever that is, you can start that kind of movement. But I digress. I want to talk, when I talk about collective and insular movements, I'm talking about two broad categories. <clears throat> the first one is the collective movement. Three examples of that. The civil rights movement. I think all of us know about the civil rights movement. I think if you haven't, go see the movie Selma. It's great. Um, there's also, get to, just get involved in the civil rights movement, learning about it. That was one broad movement with various groups involved. You had SNCC, SCLC, you had CORE, which those three together founded COFO. Those three groups alone that I just mentioned were part of a collective effort to have African Americans get their voting rights, to have a say in society for once, that's one example of a collective movement. The other collective movement is, if not was, Occupy. Whether it was Chicago, Springfield, Milwaukee, Oakland, wherever, people had an Occupy. The idea that people can come together, talk about the issues, and worry about what's going on. For me, it was in Springfield, and we wanted to keep the elected officials in the Capitol accountable, insofar that we actually dropped the banner during the Chicago Mercantile Exchange Bill. That was one of our agendas, to keep them accountable, says vote for me, not for greed. We also kept the city government accountable by not banning the homeless in downtown Springfield. That was our goal, 
in Springfield as a little micro movement. Uh, we saw that bigger movement here in Chicago during NATO. That was one big collective effort. And the last one, which I got early on in my activism in the late 90s, was the anti-globalization movement. I was there in Seattle in 99. And then coming back here in Chicago and doing all those marches and rallies to say, you know, forget IMF and WTO and all that. That was one big collective effort also. So it doesn't have to be centralized. All of us was very decentralized from Seattle to New York to New Orleans to the Twin Cities. It's one big collective effort and it's still going on. To this day there's things called People Movement Assemblies, PMAs, where starting in June, people going to Philadelphia, Jackson, Mississippi, and San Jose, California, to come together and talk about the issues. And that's still going on. So what do I mean by insular movements? These are movements that are within a group and within an organization. The three examples is the Paris Commune. How many people know of the Paris Commune? No? No? This is a, during a time in Paris when, dare I say it, the capitalists <laughs> were saying that, you know, workers pretty much have no rights, have poor working conditions. They were treating everyone horribly, and the workers just came together. They met, you know, the musical Les Miserables? That was part of the Paris Commune. They talked about the Paris Commune within Les Miserables. Um, so this uprising of people that's coming together within their own movement started various other organizations and just started within. There was no collective effort from other parts of France or Europe. It was just one centralized thing. The other one, uh, this is a good book also, um, but specifically the Zapatistas in Mexico when the Zapatistas took over the town of Chapatas, pretty much saying the Mexican government, and I believe it was Fox, who was still present then, said, you know, enough is enough, yo basta. The Zapatistas took over their own town. And Subcomandant Marcos was the leader, I should say more out front, of that movement. And that's still going on today. And that's just one little village that's standing their ground. There's no collective or decentralized movement. People support them. But that is still going on. And the last one is the Unitarian Church. Um, and I bring that up because uh, the president of Unitarian Universalist Association, Peter Morales, said in one of his speeches that a movement to him means it starts within the organization. So in his view, the UUA, the National Organization of the Unitarian Universalists, of movement is just within that community alone in taking on social justice issues. I personally don't prescribe to that. But that's how he feels, and that's how other people feel. So what are we so how does a movement begin? It could be just getting together like this, a room full of people to just talk about the issues, synthesize information, and then maybe go out and do certain actions or, you know, go out and talk to other people or other discussion groups. Maybe it's taking on current legislation. Maybe it's running a candidate. Whatever that is, a movement begins somewhere. There is no real formula to making a movement. There's a lot of best practices and decent examples but a movement is what people want it to be. In the f six examples I provided, hopefully you guys know about those and understand that those six movements, or at least the ones you know of, can provide you some sort of a model of what a movement is. But we cannot talk about movements without talking about the problems in social movements. One of those um, issues, and this is a fairly recent book that came out two years ago, 
Michael Dawson <laughs> with the book Blacks In and Out of the Left, where he actually talks about that the black community does come in and out of the left for various reasons. Some of them don't like the ideology, some of them don't like the politics, some of them don't like the direction the left was going to. And it's not just them. There are other communities of color in organizations I've been involved with that this is a, an issue. In the Latino community, women, youth, this is a problem. And it's always been addressed. The other issue is ideology. I mean, this room alone, we can say capitalism or socialism, and we know how that goes, right? <laughs> so, I mean, even if we're saying, yeah, let's take a socialist approach, and I was like, no, do it this way. No, that's a problem. <clears throat> and the other one <coughs> is the nonprofit industrial complex. What do you mean by that? The nonprofit industrial complex simply means nonprofit NGOs profiting off the injustices of other people. And I can give you scores of other organizations who does this, but simply it's organizations that go out and recruit people and ask for money, and all those monies go towards administrative pay. That they really don't do real work in community organizing, don't actually sit down and talk to someone face to face saying, what's the problem? It's like, here, sign my card. We'll call you. And for me, that's not a movement. A movement is talking to people, listening to the problems, networking with other organizations, maybe partnering with other organizations, and seeing how we can move forward. So, Am I for, am I personally for a collective movement? I am, because I was brought up that way. Um, but I also see why insular movements exist and why they're there. And while I appreciate that, um, having more of a collective movement actually going into communities and talking to people, listening to people, having civil discourse with people, as well as thy enemy. And I think that's another key thing with movements, is listening to the other side, rather than talking past people. That's how a real movement is going to happen. So what's that future? Um, as I said at a panel event in Western Illinois, when they asked me about the future of Occupy, um, I don't know. What I do know is we're in the 21st century. And because of that, we have phones, we have technology. Technology is great, but there's limits with technology. What I also know is that ideas change over time. And what might have worked in the 80s or 90s or 70s may not work today. Fundamentals work. You always stay with your fundamentals but actually doing things that may have worked in the 70s and apply them to 2015, I say good luck. Some things work, some things don't. But that's the beauty about movements. It's all about experimentation. Experimenting on who you can work with and having those strategic partnerships to advance your agenda, to advance your politics. So, with that, I'm just going to open the questions and end it right there. Got you, got you. Where's Brown? Hey. Brown's a Brown's yes, Brown. uh, Sid Cohen. Please. Brown, please. Sid? What's your uh, overall philosophy, your basic philosophy? I mean, you're talking about movements and everything, mm -hmm. which is fine. Yeah. But then you have to have something to bring it together right. into a structure. What's yes. your structure? And for that, that has to come to the group that's creating that movement of creating that structure. 
Um, I mean, if you're talking about my personal philosophy, um, I don't think my personal philosophy will talk about that, but what I can say, my approach to making movements is bringing people, bringing, excuse me, recruiting people in that have the right skill sets and you and utilize them in the best places in order to get the work done. Because it's one thing to say I want you, 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 and you, but I know where your skill sets are. I know Todd's great at tech. So I'm going to be like looking at Todd for stuff. I know Charlie's good at talking to people, so I'm going to look at Charlie and do all that kind of work. So to answer your question, it's all about knowing who your resources are in order to plug them in into the movement. Do you want to increase, sir? Okay. Um, how do you start a political movement, and how do you maintain a political movement? And the only reason I ask is that there's a lot of people who claim to know how. What are the basic tenets? So, to start one, I would turn to the Founding Fathers with the Continental Congress. And that, that's the best practice I've ever seen, and that is people just come together in homes, or meet at restaurants, or wherever, and just talking about it, you know, hash out this concept of this movement. So like with Occupy, specifically Springfield, we all met at a pizza place and saying, what does Occupy mean? This is what Occupy Wall Street is saying. How do we conceptualize that in Springfield and move it forward? But your second question is the most important question. How do you retain it? And it's just like in your organization, you have to retain it by keep by maintaining your program. You have to maintain it by, excuse me, talking to those involved, your volunteers or a member. If you have a membership, talking to your membership and stay invisible. Those are the few things that I feel are the ways to retain that movement. Because if you don't talk to anyone that's working with you, then you're pretty much getting no traction. You have to even keep your program out front and stand on that program message of here's what we're about, here's what we're doing, and this is how we're going to achieve it. Yes. Pat Butler? Yeah. Uh, with, uh, with all of the uh, things that you've been saying about all of these various, and I would call them splinter groups, yes. how at a time when probably the biggest problem this country is facing right now is a flaccid economy, and it's no secret, give a guy a good job at decent wages and with good health care and that kind of thing, you solve a myriad of other problems as well. Uh, what is the advantage of having all of these balkanized splinter groups who in many cases, I think you'll agree with me, end up sitting around in coffee houses talking to themselves rather than reaching out to organizations that can help in these things. Right. Organized labor uh, in the major cities, usually the Democratic Party, uh, and basically form alliances with power centers that are already there. And uh, I tend to be a very goal-oriented person. I'm not really interested particularly in theory. I'm interested in next week, you know, are five more people going to have a job than had this week? That kind of thing. Uh, how do you hope to, and I, and, and I watched Occupy, you know, when it was most active. <laughs> I'm a newspaper reporter. Mm -hmm. I tried to interview some of their leaders. Guess what? They had no leaders. I felt like a Roman centurion asking, where's Spartacus? And they said, I'm Spartacus, I'm Spartacus, I'm Spartacus. <laughs> it's hard to do concrete business that way. How do you plan to get around this sort of thing so the things that you and most of the people in this room would like to accomplish can do it in a practical, effective, uh, prompt manner, rather than having our grandsons and granddaughters having the same conversation a hundred years from now. Well, I too am Spartacus. So, um, <laughs> so um, you do see the point. I do. Um, uh, again, uh, 
there's again there's not one perfect answer in order in order for me to provide you an a to your question. But what I can say is, I am also of the opinion, in my opinion alone, that I feel organizations who are starting movements should also have various, I guess you would call subgroups, in order to advance your message. And that's already happening now. This fight for 15 that's going on in Chicago, that's under SEIU. Action Now, they're funded by SEIU. SEIU has many front groups that also funds the Democratic Party. So, I mean, it happens. I mean, that's what's going on now. I mean, that's why you see everyone downtown and talking to the McDonald's workers or talking about Rauner. You know, it all funnels into one group. And I think that's a, a strategy to be learned. Because I'm doing that for my own organization, which is a bookstore cooperative. You know, but I'm taking lead from the Black Panthers, the Young Lords, Second Wave Feminists, Punks, Socialists, of what they did, you know, which is provide free breakfast, free water, providing jobs for homeless, for youth, for women, having a safe space and everything. So, I mean, to answer your question, the essence of it is, is to find what your program is doing and stay on that and if your organization can't work then create something else to help fulfill, fulfill that void because it's already doing it's already happening now it's been happening for some time and i encourage people to do the same yes. uh, I, I thought about david, david singer and then dan bader i thought about this question for a very long time and I think that uh, social movements get going when uh, the um, ruling class feels their pocketbooks are threatened. As uh, that was, you know, the basic cause of the American Revolution, or the Southern Secession, or uh, when 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 millions feel their stomachs growling, which is the basis for the uh, Hitlerian Revolution in Germany. But you can talk and talk and talk to people who are happy and satisfied, got a job, and I think that the that the uh, you're not going to get anywhere. Mm -hmm. and, and I and I think that the rulers of this country uh, are smart enough to know that they can't take absolutely everything; that they have to share some of the wealth with the uh, middle and lower classes. A social revolution. A mass movement takes place only when millions of people are hungry or when a, a powerful in group uh, like uh, the Southern Planters in 1851 felt they might lose their power. And the same thing is about the, the American Revolution. Uh, the British started screwing, the British government started screwing around with American, with, okay. the, with the American profits. That was the last straw. Goodbye, Britain. Okay, what's your question? <laughs> my, my, I have no question, I have only a point. Okay. That's the way. Well, I mean, if I could just extend that a little bit further, what you're saying. Well, all right, the question is, well, aren't you overlooking the most, the most important uh, issue of all? Uh, which is uh, for people other than the world to do hunger, unemployment, etc. And for those in power, the feeling that they might lose power. Otherwise, you're not talking, you're talking to yourself. So to address that specifically, um, and I was going to help you out with that, um, Tom Merce edited this book, Movement of Movements. This is a great book. He has interviewed different people who've been involved in different movements in Latin America, United States, Asia, Africa. Um, and he talks about not just excuse me, people versus lower class, upper class, but even indigenous people. Like the, in Brazil, there's the land 
less movement that's going on in Brazil. He talks about that and interviews one of the leaders from there. Um, Subcomponent Marcos is in here as well. Um, There's another book, Soccer Players. What people don't know about soccer, that A, it's fun. But secondly, um, soccer has a long history of being in social movements. For those of you who know how soccer got started, it was started like in England with British shoulder, soldiers in India. And they wanted to suppress them, them being those in the subcontinent in India. And then from that moment forward, people started soccer clubs. When the World Cup happened in South Africa, all the soccer players said, no, we're not going to play if Coca-Cola is a sponsor. They refused to play. So Coca-Cola kind of weaned back. When World Cups happened in Brazil, they said, don't go into indigenous areas to build stadiums. I'm going to be there for like three days. And then what? The soccer clubs and players were like, no, don't do that. Some soccer clubs have actually did protests in front of governments by playing soccer games in front of the government buildings to block the people and the police. So my point is, um, no, it doesn't have to be just inequality of finances. It has, it happens everywhere when it comes to like people who are in the working class, soccer players, it also happens in academia, where we saw at UIC, where all the educators, the adjunct, the full-time faculty took a stand. So, I mean, it happens all over the board, but it goes back to what you're saying, being more organized, going back to what you're saying about retaining, and what have you. So everything's all encapsulated. All right, Dan Bader? Yeah. Um, it, What's your thought on the problem of ideologies? In this sense, you know, if you have an ideology, it often takes on a utopian form. Yes. Like uh, today, capitalism has kind of gone, you know, free market fundamentalism, and it's a, a set of beliefs that people sign on to. And there's been forms of communism uh, that match it. Right. And whenever you get that going, it seems like there's a lot of damage that uh, goes down. Uh, you know, including a lot of people being killed and removed. But how do you talk about that uh, in terms of, you know, all of these movements where you're actually discussing uh, what an ideology is, you know, what a set of beliefs are, and how hard it is to ever walk it back. And, you know, that, so, with regard to ideology, people, what I've told people in different organizations who have the same ideology is to stick with just the philosophy of the aims of what the program is. Don't say, and I'm specifically talking about socialist groups, and I've had many discussions with socialists about this, that do not, in my view, it's okay to talk about people like Karl Marx, Rosa Luxemburg, Victoria Gramsci, it's great to talk about them and what they've done. But don't put them up here <laughs> because putting them up here doesn't do us a service. Just like Republicans, don't put Reagan up here because he hasn't served anything. He's still a person, right? Mm -hmm. But stick with your philosophy. You know, if I was, if I was a capitalist, I mean, I would tell people, like, like, don't put these people on high. Stick with the plan. Stick to the main philosophy. What is the program aims for the social, the environmental, and the economic goals that we're trying to achieve? So it's great to talk about division of labor that Marx talked about. It's great to talk about women's struggle that Rosa Luxemburg talks about. But don't make them Jesus. Charlie Paydock and then Carl Schwartz. Yeah, AJ, I just gave 10 bucks for membership in the Jane Adams Senior Caucus. And I... Thank you. 
I, you know, I feel that's about a, as much as I want to do. I mean, I've seen Gene downtown hooting and hollering outside my office. <laughs> He's singing, him and his pals are singing songs, getting arrested. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Isn't that good enough? Or, uh, That's fine. I mean, I've, I mean, not too I, long ago, I mean, three months ago, someone asked me about... He, he enjoyed doing it. You know, and that's great. I'm glad Gene's out there, you know, being a rebel rouser out there doing that. I've, three months ago, someone asked me about these, like, <laughs> armchair activists, just do the Facebook, Twitter, and stuff like that. Um, and my view on that is... Not like that, but what you're doing, giving money, that's fine. Do what you can. I, for myself, I feel like I need to be involved in organizations or stay on top of things, because that's just me. If I want to give 10 bucks here, 10 bucks there, go to change.org and say, yeah, I'll sign my <laughs> name on this petition, that's fine. If you want to. So I mean, just I mean, do what you can. You don't have to be involved in everything, but hopefully, sometime down the road, you can be involved to kind of help distribute the volunteer. Is something that needs to happen. Uh, yes. Uh, um, I didn't know. If, I wanted to know if you were familiar with uh, Chicago Critical Mass. Yes. And then, where does that fit on this spectrum of like? collective uh, effort. So, I know Chicago Critical Mass. And they, um... You might have to explain to the, the crowd. Oh, so, Chicago Critical Mass, um, I call it a bike group. And they meet, usually, if they have a website or on Craigslist, I don't know where they post their stuff. I think they have a website, don't they? Yes. And they say, you know, meet at this location. A lot of people will come together on their bikes and generally it will bike down a path, and I don't know if there's a rhyme or reason to the path, but their goal is just to get people out, in my view. But they're all for bike safety, and if someone does get hit by a car or something tragic happens, then around town you might see these big white painted bikes, and that is an, a memorial for that person who died on a bike. I consider that more of a collective thing. I mean, they don't do anything political. I mean, I've worked with Critical Mass and asked them if they want to bike alongside us to bury us, have a be between, be a barrier between us and the police or whatever, right? So they can do certain things. So they're, they're, they're apolitical, but they care about the community. And that's fine, too. Um, Marcos Munez, who was Cesar Chavez's right-hand person who lives in I believe in Little Village. He is, all he's done is clean up the street. And then people start seeing that and they start cleaning the block and then they start cleaning up the neighborhood. You know, he was involved, he was alongside Chavez, you know, so he's been in Delano, he worked at the Boston office. So he felt, you know, just cleaning up. That's a political, I mean, that's also a movement too. You know, so a movement doesn't have to be this big political theater hoopla. It doesn't have to be that. It could also be this movement, but not the Taco Bell movement. That's a whole movement that needs to end. <laughs> okay, so David Travis? Uh, yes, I heard <coughs> you say that you're going to open a bookstore. Yes. Uh, Will you be having any of the Ayn Rand books in your store? Possibly. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> it's my bookstore. I can have whatever I want in my bookstore. I just ask you what you're, if you're going to have it. And I said possibly. Okay. So. Depend on what the market wants, right? I mean, I, well, no, I mean, I might have absolute, I like, I like Alice Shrug. You know, I, I'll put that in there. There's some things of Ayn Rand I like. I don't like everything about her, but I, I appreciate objectivism. Yeah, um, when you talk about socialists, they always try to organize workers. Yeah. On what level are you organizing workers? Well, it depends on how you define worker. Well, somebody in a fast food place, uh -huh. somebody that works for a boss, uh -huh. where the boss makes a profit off of them. So, in some circles, not specifically Chicago, 
some socialist organizations are working with like IWW to have those workers have a union in those fast food places and everything and retail stores. Um, Kim Ortiz, who's a socialist in uh, New York City, she's working with, um, I forget what the acronym is, but it's Retail Workers something organization. And she has a be at the AJ Musty Memorial Building and educates them about a union, educates them about you know, your rights and then how to do a union and goes out <laughs> into various retail shops Excuse me. and hopefully do that or at least educate the public to know what the retail workers are making and what rights they have also. So I mean at that level things like that are happening. Pardon me? Yes. Oh, you want a fresh cut? Uh, well, here, Charlie. This time. Go ahead. Me? Okay. Yeah. Uh, the socialists in particular yes. like to talk about their solidarity with the American worker and that kind of thing. Yes. And yet, I know people in the organized labor movement. <coughs> uh -huh. I am a former chairman of the Chicago Newspaper Guild myself. And I have yet to hear of socialists passing out literature, trying to organize people outside factory gates, uh, trying to forge links with groups Can like the AFL-CIO, where power already exists that merely needs to be expanded and you know made uh, made relevant. Um, what what is it about the American Socialist Party? Because you sure don't see this in Europe much. Uh, what is it about the American Socialist Party where there seems to be an aversion to actually sitting down with coal miners, with steel mill workers, with factory workers at all levels, and explaining to them the importance of saving organized labor while there's still that opportunity? Because as I think you'll agree, your job has become much harder in the last 20 years mm -hmm. with the demise of uh, organized labor right. as we've known it. So in the last 20 years, most socialists and communists have been chastised by the media and government during World War II. Okay, that was 70 years ago. Still being chastised today. And in this book, which is also a good book, that outlines what socialists, anarchists, and communists have done with workers that work alongside them. Um, I do believe Eugene Debs worked with Pullman and got, you know, black porters to work also and did a strike down there. So that was one work. Big Bill Hayward, chairperson of Socialist Party USA, who founded IWW, founded here in Chicago, worked alongside workers, just like Haymarket. Now, I am talking about quasi-antiquated events, but because there has been splinter groups, as you said earlier, with socialists, because of ideology, which I refer to as a problem in the movement, because of that, all the work has been fractioned because of that. And it doesn't help matter any when you have certain socialist groups going to an AFL-CIO and doesn't want to work with socialists, and rather work with the Democratic Party, who gets candidates elected. So that's the other problem also. When you have big unions over the last 30 years, maybe 40 years, have been alongside the Democratic Party and getting those candidates elected, instead of working with the very groups that have been alongside them since the early 1900s. Because they were right there with the coal miners. Norman Thomas, Eugene Debs, everyone else was right there with the coal mines and the factories saying, you have a right. Democratic Party has never been there. Charlie? Yeah, AJ, recently on the transit group, somebody posted that they were complaining that some protesters were blocking their way to catch the train, the commuter train at Union Station. And it doesn't seem like you've been at other protests and people say things like, 
well, go to Russia if you don't like it here and things like that. You know, I mean, what happened? There seems to be some disconnect here. Well, there's, there's always been disconnect with those who have been involved. Again, it goes back to my, my earlier statement where people have used the word movement loosely and people who don't have the necessary training or necessary skill set to do activism or community organizing in best practice. And because of that, you see all this disconnect between the public and activists and activists and elected officials. Hey, this and so guy forth. didn't care what the issue was. It's just that they were blocking this away. I, I don't know what to tell you, Charlie. I mean, I wasn't. I mean, I, what? Is this a large? What's wrong with the population? Here? What, what protest was that? A black it's black immaterial, black. but I mean, he wasn't I concerned know. at all. I wanted to know what the issue was. I don't know. But what the issue it was. didn't concern him. He was more interested in getting it out of my way. And, I, I really don't know. I don't how know. do we reach these know. people, though? Those who like don't understand what's going on. Or yeah. Just, again, I, I, I like to use the old phrase I used back home. You can show a meal of water, but to bring them there is a whole different other issue. I mean, I, I can show you the, the path to the goal, but if you're not willing to work alongside what that movement's about, then that's on you, not on the movement. In my view. That better? Yeah. Okay. Uh, those two have to talk. Back. Oh, yeah. Uh, you want to go there first and then come back? Is that, well, is that okay? That's that fine with me, sure. Right. No problem. Uh, Mike, uh, yeah, I've been part of the socialist movement for more than 40 years. And when you talk about a movement and you talk about the importance of uh, being part of organizations which are part of the movement yeah. or contribute to the movement, um, with the socialist movement, yeah, obviously, to, to me and to, and to you, uh, the goal is a socialist society. But uh, there's so many uh, groups and, and uh, members of the socialist movement who attack <laughs> on all this other stuff right. uh, in addition to that. And um, a lot of it is from the liberal wing of the Democratic Party. It's pretty much just uh, uh, bourgeois liberalism as far as like uh, positions on social oh, issues oh, yeah, and if socialism you got is supposed to be a, a democratic form out. of society right. why do you have people that are in the socialist uh, movement talk with putting forth in my no detail ice. every little aspect of how the future society quote unquote should look I mean um, our founding fathers they had differences <laughs> in what the new society should be you know there right. were the the Federalists and the uh, and the Decentralists, uh, you know, uh, that was basically Adams against Jefferson right. in, in a nutshell. But why do people that are, are supposedly they're they're talking a good game about bringing about a more democratic society? Uh, why are these people insisting that this uh, society, in every minute detail, conform to this preconceived uh, uh, mold? Within the socialist movements? Yeah. So, I mean, I guess, like I said earlier, about ideology, but also about factions within movements, right? So, when I have my radio show, I've had very socialist and various socialist groups on my show, and I ask them, what makes your socialist organization better or equal to other socialist organizations? Because if you really think about it, there's six or seven different social organizations in Chicago. <laughs> SPUSA, Socialist Party of the United States, Democratic Socialists of America, Party of Liberation Socialism, um, the Ruhu Movement, which is a pan-African socialist group, um, Solidarity, Socialist Alternative, and International Social Organization. Seven socialist groups in Chicago. News and letters. And social, what? News and letters. And news and letters. And the communist party. And then the communists, there's, there's still CPS, and there's S CCDS. There's SCP. Socialist and there's SCP, the Socialist Equality Party, and Socialist Worker Party. All those groups came from two daddies. Karl Marx, Frederick Engels. Right. All have the same names. Right. right? So it has to do with the factions, talking about, I'm all for, right, 
I'm all for a coalition. I'm all for bringing those groups together, talking about it. But that only can happen if they agree to strip down the dogmatic <laughs> philosophy that they're putting out there and just sticking with the program that it is instead of saying our socialism or communism is better than someone else's. Well, my question really was, uh, why, why are these uh, people and organizations, you know, going beyond making a socialist revolution and, and tacking on what, what, I, what I refer to as, as uh, bourgeois liberalism? Because some of those other organizations believe that that's the safest way to do it in order for power to gain that power with a capital P. Because some social organizations assume they have power, you know. Some other organizations think that if we just tack on to some of these ideals that the Democratic Party or these liberal organizations are doing, then we can move forward and advance our revolution. Whereas if you stick to, like I said earlier, the program, what that is, and actually talk about it, then you can actually advance the very goals that you're trying to achieve. <coughs> There are cabinets. Uh, Wes Wagner, uh, what is uh, your perspective on the electoral efforts in 2016? In terms of what, Wes? What? In terms of what? Uh, electoral efforts in 2016. They had two years. I mean, if the, if the question you're asking is, what's the perspective in 2016 for Greens or Socialists and all that, it's going to be the same answer two years ago, four years ago, eight years ago, and that's, I don't see anything happening until people, if I may say, get their crap together. I mean, uh, if you're asking in 2016, um, what the outlook is for moving issues forward, I think that's pretty good. A lot of people who are in issue movements, movements who are creating social movements around issues, will gain better ground than they will on the electoral front. And especially here in Chicago, you know, and especially in Illinois. I mean, we have a Republican governor, and if you go around issues to advance something, I think we would see, hopefully, a higher minimum wage that um, we can have in either 2016 or 2018. Um, fracking, hopefully we can advance the issue on fracking, the issue on railroads and stuff like that. So I think there's a much better chance to center around um, issue campaigns than we would electoral like campaigns. Yes. Do you still have a question, Tim? Yes. Um, many of this movement that you've been talking about has already been covered by the likes of people like Edward Bernays, the father of modern public relations, yeah. certain aspects of social media, the science of segmented marketing, and advertising. Yeah. I mean, what you're talking about is nothing new. How come you guys, and how, how come a lot of these movements haven't even put in some of this fundamental uh, market-based stuff that brings forward ideas? Well, I mean, I don't know what movement in particular you're talking about, but a lot of movements have done things before Bernays. And in fact, I would be saying Bernays took notes from other movements especially in marketing and all that. I mean, there's some business schools that I know of that are taking lead with certain groups. There are certain business schools like in Northwestern are doing more social enterprising <coughs> because they're taking lead from the cooperative movement, mm -hmm. you know? So I think certain people like in public relations, marketing, and so forth, they're looking towards all these things because all of us activists and organizers have done it first. Well, and actually taken those leads. Because some of them actually, the Bernays, what Bernays did, and other people took note of what <coughs> happened in Sparta, 
and grown and all that and trying to make it more of a business practice rather than but anything else. My, my question is this. I mean, a lot of these... I was just looking at some of the websites for some of these organizations here, and they're, like, way behind the times. I mean, it, it, it's just like you can't even get some basic information on the page without being flooded with a bunch of propaganda. Or, or like, um, yeah. just just going on and, and, and wanting to find out some stuff without, you know, it's just, there seems to be some very basic lack of just some basic marketing 101 that goes on with these things. But a movement doesn't necessarily equate a business plan. You know, because you're not implementing corporate principles into a movement. I do. I mean, I have always said to my, told people that uh, I went to business school. I went to the Ford School of Business. You know, I, I've taken MBA classes at right. Harvard, Yale, and everything. And I've kind of turned those things on its head to advance certain organizations and everything, right? But not a lot of people have that opportunity. Not a lot of people are educated when it comes to certain business practices and everything. There's not even schools about community organizing except right here at Albany Park that are taking lead from the Zabatas movement. And they have a master's program in community organizing. They send people to Mexico and be with the Zapatistas for a semester and learn what they're doing and then come back and doing all that stuff. Ruckus Society does it. Midwest Organization, which is here in Chicago, they do that. Wellstone Campaign, which was funded by Senator Paul Wellstone, they do that. So there are some programs, but not a lot, because some people don't see business and community organizing as one and the same. I feel it is, and I think you can articulate some of those things, but right. you can't really articulate um, neighborhood organizing to boardroom relations. You know, some things just doesn't mesh well. Whereas yeah, others does. But like when you're trying to bring a product to market, aren't you, you know, a lot of times using some form of marketing or advertising campaign such as getting it out and then like when you're trying to get a movement or or some type of idea propagated, aren't though aren't the same aren't the same basic fundamental principles of marketing and advertising used? To a point. I mean like I said, a movement is not a business. Again, and that's where it goes to the nonprofit that's on complex. Like I said, some of those are using it as a business. If I can get X members, we're going to get X dollars, and by X dollars we can get this person elected or advance on this issue. And that is one of the problems I think is happening, whereas going into communities and talking to people. So there is, so marketing to a point can work, but the only product that you're showing the public is the political agenda that you're trying to advance. You know, I mean, I, I can go on and on about okay. this. I mean, it's not like Shark Tank, you know, where I can go before anyone says, I want a, I want to dismantle the Federal Reserve and here's how we're going to do it. It's going to fail. Why not? All right. Uh, I've got that? a question. <laughs> uh, and that is, the old social democratic movement of the 19th century had three foci of organizing. One was the uh, labor organization. Right. Uh, second was the consumer organization, yeah. cooperatives, uh, yeah. uh, whether it was housing cooperatives or uh, investment cooperatives or uh, yeah. Think of another cooperative or a, 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 a retail uh, co-op. Um, the, the third was the party, um, political organization to address the overall structure of society, uh, the political structure of society. Uh, well. Uh, to what extent does your your collective uh, movement yeah. uh, organize with those spooky or uh, does it not uh, <coughs> is it 
think you will. <laughs> is it uh, something that uh, focuses on access living? Uh, uh, or, uh, you mean those things that how they incorporate yeah. within that? I think those are an aspect to all that stuff. Labor organizing, the cooperative movement, and the party, where that party is. They're all factions, or excuse me, they're all aspects of a movement. Because like Charlie says, yeah, if he wants to do that, you know, if yeah, people want to be part of a party, they can do that. Certainly they had youth movements, they yeah. had uh, uh, folklore movements, they had all sorts of uh, academic <laughs> movements, whatever. But, uh, and organizations, religious organizations for that matter. Uh, though the Marxists weren't too strong on right. religious organization. Uh, <laughs> how is it simply a, 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 an opportunistic approach, a situationist approach uh, to uh, how you organize uh, or or do you have uh, some sort of uh, a, a general outlook on how you're oriented to organize? No, I, I mean, there's certain opportunists that take an opportunity to advance something. There's that. Um, but the things that you're talking about is something that, Sorry. you know, I would, I would look at the Black Panther Party and what they did. The Black Panther Party had their party. And they had a, a set of ten principles or aims that they wanted. But the Black Panther Party had a free breakfast program. They had free child care. They had self-defense training. And they plugged people in what they felt was best. You know, so they even got even educators from the community in Chicago to come in and teach those who couldn't afford to send their kids to school and brought them into community centers and everything. Some of them actually protected the youth to go from 63rd and King down to 79th Street just to see family or everything. So, I mean, they had many tentacles and all of them were centralized because of one program. But because of Excuse me. the Socialist Party's general uh, outlook, uh, there was we made alliances with and worked with the Peace and Freedom Party in yes. California, uh, but we uh, didn't uh, orient ourselves to uh, the ethnicity of the Black Panther Party. Right. Uh, we, well, uh, a. Philip Randolph may have been our uh, uh, national co-chair, right. but uh, 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 and the Rupert brothers uh, may have been backers, right. <laughs> and so on. This is but, awesome. uh, but we we had we had to fight to be distinct from the, their. Yeah. Trying to push us into the Democratic Party. Right. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Okay. Well, get a job. Todd, do you have a question? Uh, I, uh, it was a while back, and the conversation moved on, so I think we got <laughs> Okay. All right. One more. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, you know, what, what I find is talking to people in general. Uh, there's not a good understanding of what unions have done for the working people, mm -hmm. people who work all over the place. Right. There's uh, uh, not, you know, people relate to unions today as, uh, you know, you have to pay dues or no. uh, maybe you get a raise, this kind of thing. But the truth is, uh, you know, unions have accomplished a lot in terms, you know, children don't have to work, you get weekends off, all, all of these kinds of things. And uh, with, with the globalization that is a real thing that's happening, 
and uh, the uh, free market perspective on the cost of labor is, you know, it's a market. And therefore, uh, you don't want to have unions. You don't want to have public employees. Right. You don't want to have anything that interferes with the operation of the free market. Right. And that means that unions will eventually, if, you know, if something doesn't happen, unions will be dissolved, mm -hmm. public employees will be reduced significantly, and a lot of other consequences will kind of flow. So, the, so the, you know, how do you, uh, uh, in, in terms of, you know, having limited energy, you've yeah. only got so much energy, people who are in movements have only so much energy. Right. How, how do you, uh, uh, you know, kind of crystallize the issues and the history which most people today, especially young people, uh, you know, a lot of the people sitting here have memories that go back yeah. quite a ways. But, if, you know, people who have been born past 1980 mm -hmm. or even in, you know, late 1970s, they do not have uh, knowledge of a lot of things. So that seems to me to be a, what's your thought? So I feel I've been very fortunate in my lifetime because I love history and I love information. Um, I grew up where Reagan was born, so Dixon, Illinois area. Mm -hmm. um, I've had the honor of having two great parents who have bring me to Chicago, Milwaukee, mm -hmm. Florida, to lead me to say this. I have experienced various things, seen various things, and want to know stuff. So I have a deep appreciation about unions mm -hmm. and education and what everything has been provided for us. And there's even people in my generation and younger who don't get that, nor they want to know that for whatever reason. So I mean, I can't force information for them. But well, all I can do is show them, you know. And I've taken people to like Cherry, Illinois, which is a population of 200 people. Why do I bring them there? There's a coal mine down there. <clears throat> 400 people died. 19 oh, I always get this wrong. 1909, I want to say. 400 people died, mostly Italian, Irish, German immigrants, three of which were kids, the oldest being 12. Because of Cherry, Illinois, that set forth child labor laws of that time. And the union backed that. They needed protection. Now, as someone, I also have a different perspective on unions, because my dad was an independent contractor for, for electric. So I had IBEW um, threaten my family. What? I've had, I'll say this again, on camera, I've had IBEW threaten my family with lawsuits by telling me we have money aside to put your family out of business. I've actually worked in places where my father was doing jobs at, and IBEW sat right there telling them that he's taking away jobs. So I've seen the other side of the coin, too. Having said that, I have a deep appreciation with unions. I like what unions are all about, but I am not for, and I know I'm getting on my soapbox on this, I am not for big unions to tell the very businesses where they all started from the get-go to say this. It's all about experience. I've had a different experience than you, than you, you, and everyone else in here. I've I known families, three generations of communists. That's all they know. <laughs> That's their upbringing, you know. I know four gen two generations of hippies. That's all they know. What all of us need to do is to help other people take off their side blinders and start reading, start educating, have them to come to college of complexes, maybe open source temple, maybe elsewhere, to open their minds to what other ideas are there. So even though I may disagree with something, I want to know. Because I listen to conservative talk radio, not because I like Rush Limbaugh. I just want to know what he's saying. So when I'm ready to draft my talking points, 
I know what the other people are saying, right? Yeah. So all I can say is okay. to your question is, right. if you can't force information, just okay. keep educating. I'm done. All right, we want to get into the rebuttals here pretty yeah, quick. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I think Pat, Pat, yeah. Pat, you got one more question? Yeah. Yeah. Ben, yeah. you know, right. the last question the first one. before we go to rebuttals. Have you heard of the Midwest Center, I think it is? They, they trade community... The Midwest, or was it Midwest Academy? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was trained by Howard in Chicago? Yeah. What, what, what kind of socialism are they? Oh, or are they socialists? No. Or are they just liberal? Kim, Kim Bobo and oh, Aldo, okay. they are very Alinskyist yeah. disciples. Okay. What, what, would, what would you, uh, how would you characterize Alinsky? Um, I would characterize Saul Alinsky as, how many people are sports fans raise their hand? When I say sports fans, like the Boston Celtics of Red Auerbach and all that. Ooh, ooh. Critical, man. I look at Saul Linsky <laughs> like a John Wooden, Red Auerbach, because what he did was teach fundamentals of community organizing. He kind of made a science out of it, but he actually okay. taught, actually put in place how to really educate, agitate, and organize. Okay. Let's yeah. go to rebuttals. Yeah, well, let's go to Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How many people here have rebuttal remarks to make or uh, I'm up here already? Yes. One, two, three, four, five. Make it about five minutes, Brom. Five, you're, you're, yeah. About five minutes. Okay. Uh, I'd like to thank the speaker. I think yeah. he's done a very good job. And uh, he made a lot of rational sense. Now, I look Keep upon writing. Keep that writing for me. Okay. Uh, I'm a he's Marxist. On camera. I've been one since I was maybe in my early 20s. What, my and I see the world as very, uh, in two ways. One, we're progressing at a very rapid pace at this point in history. Let me explain. Where China's going is towards a real socialist society. If you look at Latin America, for instance, you look at uh, Argentina, Bolivia, uh, Brazil, and a number of other countries in Latin America, they've broken out of the American imperialist orbit and are progressing. And if you think of a place like Bolivia, I think we had a speaker here not too long ago that showed Bolivia is making real headway as far as getting its people out of poverty. So we're making a lot of headway in that respect. Now, if we look at Europe, look what's happening in Greece. Greece is starting to make progress and trying to break away from the imperialist orbit of neoliberalism, which they, the capitalist powers have been exploiting those areas for a very long period of time, and they're trying to break out of it. Same thing is happening in Spain. Same thing is happening in uh, Portugal to a certain degree. Same thing is happening in Ireland to a certain degree. I was just listening to a program talking about uh, Sinn Féin. Uh, Sinn Féin might get, might get power in Ireland. So they're breaking away out of the imperialist orbit. In the United States, we had a number of things happen. Uh, for one thing, we had the uh, Occupy Wall Street. It didn't really go very far because it didn't seem to want to have a unified group where they have a, um, some sort of leader or some sort of a structure that was too loosely formed and it broke apart to a certain degree. But it was the beginning. 
Another thing that's happening as far as, uh, let's say, uh, what's happening in Missouri. And the uh, people that are demonstrating against police brutality around the, around the country. I remember I was sitting on the bus going down Clark Street and I seen people demonstrating against police brutality. And a number of white people were also demonstrating. So people are starting to see that we're controlled by a very, very tiny percent of the population that control this economy, about one, one hundredth of one percent got most of the wealth. The last uh, statistics I read was someone like 854 people control half the wealth of the planet. So people are starting to take cognizance of those facts. Now, is there an organization that will bring them all together? Uh, I don't think so right now. And somebody else was talking about uh, different socialist organizations in the United States. But a lot of organizations that call themselves socialists aren't really socialists at all. What happened during the uh, period in Germany when Bismarck was chancellor of Germany, well, he said he, said he brought out what they call social democracy. Actually, social democracy came out of Marx. But he usurped that word, and he brought in a few reforms of capitalism and made it look like it was socialism. And a number of these so-called socialist organizations aren't really socialist. If you look at the Russian Revolution, you had the Mensheviks, the social revolutionaries, the cadets. They all called themselves socialists, but they weren't really socialists. What they were is buffers against overthrowing capitalism, like Roosevelt was during the 1930s. They had that sort of thing. But people are starting to wake up. Why? It's because the world economy, the capitalist economy, is going down the drain. And they, and they have no way to save it. So what they're doing is super exploiting the working class, called neoliberalism. That time. That's, that's what it is. So this neoliberalism is also starting to fall apart. All right. And the only way forward mm -hmm. is through socialism. All right. All right. Go ahead, Jane Thanks a lot, A.J. Uh, I also want to announce that I don't think he said it, but A.J. is the chair of the Unitarian University for Social Justice. Um, I want to talk a little bit about this movement idea with uh, two things, democracy and discipline. Uh, I saw this Wednesday. Wednesday, uh, I and a thousand and a half or two thousand people were in Springfield. We had a simple message. I don't know that it got across as well as it should. This is a revenue crisis in Illinois. Uh, not a spending crisis. I'm not sure that that got across. Uh, in the Tribune they said, oh, this was union organized. Uh, that was not true. Unions were a part of it, but they were part of community organization. And many, many organizations went together. Our, dis our democracy was pretty good. Just about everybody who wanted to go down there took part. That part was good. Our discipline was less than perfect, I, I have to admit. And that's why Jane Adams Senior Caucus is considering joining NPA. NPA joins democracy and discipline. If you go to one of their demonstrations, anybody can join in. We all participate in uh, planning, and when you get out there, uh, it's a disciplined event. I remember seeing this. The leader throws his hand, her hand, into the air, and everybody throws their hand into the air, and everybody is immediately silent. That lets everybody know in that group, and the group you're opposing, 
that this is a movement and not a mob. I think that's something we need to get across. I'm hoping that Jane Adams Senior Caucus does join uh, NPA. I think this will help us a lot because the guys, and it's mainly guys, that we oppose uh, got the money on their side. All we got is the people. But we people have to unite and uh, discipline ourselves through democracy or we won't get far. Thank you. Uh, good evening. I uh, would like to uh, take issue with what Mr. Bader said this evening on two points. Uh, Mr. Bader mentioned that uh, movements, people like uh, those who uh, extol capitalism or communism, that uh, they tend to idealize these things and, and uh, present them as utopian. But uh, the fact is, while I've heard many uh, socialists and communists present their point of view as utopian, uh, the uh, libertarians, uh, of which I'm a member, I have never ever heard any of them, which by the way, they, they are quite pro-capitalist, I've never ever heard any of them present capitalism as a utopian point of view. In fact, they present uh, capitalism in this way, and I've heard many of them say this, that capitalism is the worst system on earth, except for all the others. Uh, so uh, never have I heard capitalism presented as utopian. Uh, in other words, it's a tough go no matter what system you're in. Capitalism's a tough go, but the other ones are worse. Uh, also, the second issue I wish to, um, the second thing I wish to take issue with on uh, Mr. Bader having presented that eventually there will be okay. a disillusion okay. of the unions. But the fact is that capitalists want unions because it is much easier to deal with one person in behalf of an entire collective on bargaining for wages, then they have to bargain with thousands of them one at a time and say, okay, we'll give you this much go to work, we'll give you that much go to work, when they can deal with one representative who says, all right, all my bricklayers have to earn X amount, and they say, okay, we'll pay that. So it, it's, the union is something that uh, capitalists business Right want to hear. Right it it yeah. makes it easier for them. Uh, the other sure. thing I want to mention is that the dichotomy uh, between socialism and capitalism is simply that uh, under, uh, un under, under communism, if I have a job, I have a job. I have to just do my job every day, and if I become unhappy, there isn't very much I can do. But if I'm under a capitalist system, and I don't like my job, I can say to my boss, excuse me, but uh, listen, you son of a bitch, take your goddamn job and shove it up your ass because I quit. Everyone has the freedom to quit their job whenever well, they want. Yeah, right. Well, how do I follow that? Anytime I feel like it, I quit my job. I just wanted to uh, say a few uh, little things about a bunch of stuff. Um, I just wanted to say first that um, the, the Paris Commune was uh, not the background. Uh, for uh, Les Miserables. Uh, Les Miserables uh, took place in the 1820s. Thank you. There was a uh, <laughs> Republican revolution. Um, and and I, I mean, the society there had gone back to a, a monarchical type of society. And so it was that revolution of the 1820s that was uh, the backdrop to Les Mis. Um, uh, AJ, you said that uh, uh, within a movement, uh, 
people disagreeing with each other is a problem. Um, I kind of have a problem uh, with that uh, statement, uh, you know, like I alluded to in, in one of my questions, uh, the, um, our founding fathers had uh, profound disagreements about the, the way the, the society should take shape, but they put the, aside those differences to accomplish job one, which was to, to make a revolution, to throw off the monarchy. And uh, I, I think that the socialist movement can really uh, take that example to heart as far as uh, get together. You know, who cares uh, how much uh, 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 the ISO knows about Lenin and Trotsky compared to the SEP, you know, and, and stuff like that. Uh, put aside your differences and, and, uh, and uh, let's do job one, which, which is uh, to have, uh, yeah, I'm on the same page with you about having a socialist society. Um, when you said um, that what worked in the 60s, 70s, and 80s may not work today, my, my reaction was, uh, what worked in the 60s, 70s, and 80s? You know, I don't remember anything really working, and then I thought, well, maybe he means, um, you know, the war in Vietnam was ended uh, earlier than it would have been otherwise. There were strides made towards um, um, uh, civil rights, but, you know, um, what do we have now again? Uh, uh, all that uh, was gained in Vietnam uh, was, was mainly gained uh, by the ruling class. Uh, they, they, they figure out better ways of selling a war these days. So we have this unrelenting stuff. Uh, uh, civil rights gains are, are being um, attacked and uh, you know this uh, uh, photo ID uh, voter registration uh, business. So uh, the system just keeps on reinventing uh, in new improved ways of, of, of attacking uh, us the people and uh, so I said yeah my, my initial reaction was I think on target if not on uh, Kmart is uh, it's really um, sorry for that bad joke but uh, you know what really worked then uh, no, nothing really worked it, it, it worked uh, on behalf of the ruling class more than us uh, you know working schlumps um, an audience member said uh, Occupy had uh, no leaders. Uh, they actually did. There was a leadership. Uh, uh, very, I was in the Occupy Chicago movement, and uh, very quickly the uh, International Socialist Organization hijacked that, uh, that noble and beautiful thing, which was uh, the Occupy movement, at, at least in Chicago. And it was basically an uh, ISO-run uh, show, and uh, um, it was a shame. It was a shame what happened there. Um, uh, I find it uh, bemusing, if not uh, somewhat ingenuous, when, when people of uh, succeeding generations in the socialist movement invoke the IWW as being like part and parcel of the same thing. Um, of course, the Socialist Party in those days had a lot of uh, members that uh, uh, admired the IWW, but uh, every official uh, statement, uh, all the journalism done within the IWW was uh, totally disdainful of even the need uh, for uh, uh, political action for a socialist political party. According to the IWW, all that was necessary was, uh, was the union, a uh, proper uh, revolutionary democratic union, and that the new society would be founded uh, on the that would be the foundation of the new society. Um, uh, Big Bill Haywood's um, uh, second uh, man uh, spent a couple of years in France, uh, talked to a lot of uh, French uh, uh, anarcho-syndicalists, and the IWW was founded as an anarcho-syndicalist organization, which had absolutely no need, whatever, and was uh, publicly disdainful of the idea of engaging in electoral politics and having a socialist uh, uh, party organization. Um, AJ, you mentioned uh, the, uh, the IBEW threatening you uh, right away. What sprung to my mind was uh, my mother, who was, uh, she served a term as secretary treasurer up in Milwaukee County, the uh, county administrative uh, employees. Now this um, bargaining unit included everyone from uh, a clerk one up to a senior systems analyst. And so it was a range of incomes, yet they had uh, a flat due structure. So every employee paid the same monthly amount in dues, which was uh, not that significant for a senior systems analyst, but for someone making the wage uh, level of a clerk one, it was, uh, uh, it was burdensome. And so uh, she was working towards uh, uh, getting a, a percentage uh, due assessment that, that would be more equitable, uh, you know, 
a percentage of pay dues assessment. Uh, but uh, Gerald McAtee, I think he might still be the president of this AFSCME. Um, uh, uh, he and his people said, no, that's too much trouble. And she went, to, she talked to one of the programmers in her bargaining unit, and he says, I could write a program within 15 minutes. You just put that in place, and uh, you know, each month uh, it, it's going to calculate those, uh, those dues properly. It's the easiest thing in the world to do. But she, she became like a pest to the, the, uh, the national organization. After one of the meetings, she came out to find all uh, her, uh, her tires were slashed, all four of them. <laughs> so the, this is an organization that carries out its threats, uh, ask me, at least they did with her. Um, uh, when you say you, you, you like unions, um, uh, I wouldn't say that the, um, there's a difference between unions like the AFL-CIO to me and uh, unionism. And the AFL-CIO does not uh, practice uh, unionism. Uh, they, they are a business-oriented organization that uh, bargains a contract that's in place for whatever term, three, four, five, six years. And, um, but do they actually uh, practice unionism in the true definition of the word? No, the uh, AFL-CIO is, is not into that. Okay. Probably the two biggest social gains made in recent American history was the GI Bill of Rights passed after World War II, which enabled hundreds of thousands of people to go to college. They were the first members of their families to go to college and to move into the middle class. And the uh, advent of the American labor movement, for all of its faults, and, the, and they have stumbled many, many times, the American labor movement was able to help hundreds of thousands of people from, let's say, the 1920s up until probably the 1980s, 1990s, when the union started declining, because some people thought we no longer needed unions. <laughs> this was a, this enabled plenty of people to lead comfortable lives that they would not have been able to lead otherwise. Because the fact of the matter is, when you go into your boss as an individual and say, gee, I need a raise, and he's going to say, that's nice, so do I, uh, nice talking to you. If, on the other hand, you're dealing with a union official who represents, you know, perhaps 100, 200 people uh, in a business, he speaks for those people he is listened to and taken far more seriously by management. And I can tell you this from personal experience. I worked for the Learner newspapers for a number of years, later Pioneer Press. Uh, both of them were uh, part of the same union, the Chicago Newspaper Guild. Now, if I had gone into my boss and said, gee, I think I need a raise, and here are the reasons, he would have said, nice talking to you, uh, you know, pick up your things on the way out. Um, on the other hand, the Newspaper Guild was able to help a number of people live very, very comfortable lives because of the fact that they were represented by a union, and incidentally, an AFL-CIO affiliate, uh, but this was an AFL-CIO affiliate that spoke for the workers, that represented the workers, and that kept uh, tabs on the workers' interest. Part of the problem for the demise of unions is ennui on the part of the workers themselves. Especially in the bigger unions, they've, they've taken the position that, oh well, I don't need to go to meetings, I don't need to participate. Joe Blow over there, who's our uh, you know, shop steward, he'll take care of it. And then the, the shop steward is going to say, oh, I don't need to worry about what our vice president is doing. That'll be taken care of by the national, and so on down the line. That's where you get crooked unions. That's where you get all of the things that people have complained about, about unions. Every organization, if you leave it alone and don't mind the store and don't mind its business, will fall 
uh, into uh, corruption of one kind or another. I don't care whether it's the United States government, the church, whatever. Don't watch it. Don't mind the store. It's going to go down the tubes. The same is true with unions. Unions mean unions. People working together in common interest. It's three dollars. It's a. It's. I'm it's. Sorry. It's it okay. is probably just, one of the know. greatest human institutions oh, just, that has been developed okay. in the Western world. Now, I have a special beef with American socialists. It is not so much what their beliefs individually are, it is their absolutely juvenile marketing techniques. I've gone to a couple, in the 1960s, I went to a couple socialist meetings because I'm a very curious person. I walked into one meeting, I don't remember which branch of the socialists it was. Okay, it was, I saw red flags all over, literally. Uh, there was a picture of Lenin up there, there was a picture of Marx up there. I kind of figured, hmm, I'm an American. I don't see Samuel Gompers, I don't see Teddy Roosevelt, who was incidentally quite a reformer himself. Uh, I don't see people like that. I see, I see these uh, foreign theoreticians who are going to presume to dictate to Americans how we should live in ways that they think is best for us, instead of our own homegrown people. And we had them, uh, and we'll continue to have them. Instead of listening to our own people, you know, we're listening to guys who've been dead for 50 years, and had absolutely no idea that this was not uh, a czarist agricultural economy, that we were in fact, by that time, one of the powerhouses of the world economically, that the tactics that we needed to use here were quite different than the tactics that were used in Russia. Fortunately, a lot of reforms, a lot of gains were made in this country without having had the streets run with blood. We did not have to have a French Revolution. Sorry for the people that may have wanted to lop off the heads of the aristocrats, it became unnecessary. In fact, some members of those aristocratic families became avid union supporters themselves because they knew what was right and what was good for their system. Case in point, Franklin Delano Roosevelt had some of the bluest blood of all the blue bloods of this country. He was considered a traitor to his class, but he was a wise enough person to know that if he didn't do something, and if labor was not more adequately respected and represented, there was going to be bloody revolution. And so he acted in the best interests of everyone. And there are still people today who whisper, mostly in Republican circles, at Tea Party circles, oh, that Roosevelt, he was a closet red, you know. The fact of the matter is he was anything but a red. He was interested in saving the system, and in so, in so doing, if it's necessary to give workers a livable standard of living, then it's better to pay that price than lopping off heads uh, at the Place de la Concorde. Uh, okay. We have... We, you know, if you're going to have a socialist party, you got to change your marketing. You got to market it as an inherently American organization designed for and by Americans. I don't give a rat's you know what, what Karl Marx taught 150 years ago, or what Lenin thought. I want to know what American labor leaders and American workers are thinking today. Because the problems that we face today are tumultuous, they're big, huge. They are not the same problems that Marx and Lenin faced in their day. It's time for us to live with the times. If we do it quickly enough, we can still save the American Labor Union. And if not, then I guess we better be prepared for a return to urban serfdom. Thank you. All right.
of making a movement to transform the social relations of our, our community, our worldwide community. That problem is that our society is organized with those who are in power, that is, the owner-investor class, otherwise known as capitalists, and though generally the rest of the society, the working class. Are there other classes? Yes, there are. And when you, you have to look to see what kind of basis, uh, what kind of emphasis, uh, and move. Hello, is this thing working? No. 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 Uh, you have to look to see what is the common interest of those you expect to move to change the society and the social relations of the society, you have to see where they are coming from. Are they, and since the basic class division is between the working class and the owning, investing class, You have to base yourself very clearly on the working class if you're going to make a democratic change in the society. If you're interested in equality and fraternity in your society and not promoting and continuing uh, class divisions, yet you have to look to the working class, and that means you're, you're going to have to base your, your social organizations and your movement on that class. Now, the class is broad. It's got all sorts of different interests. There are uh, divisions, social divisions of all kinds of natures. But if you don't base yourself on the working class, you're not really going to be a socially democratic movement. And that's why, uh, you, the, why uh, the socialists uh, who backed the Soviet Union as a socialist paradise were traitors to democratic socialism. Uh, they instead they they back a class society, a class that perpetuates itself as a capitalist class. Today, even on the ruins of the old Soviet Union. Well. <laughs> The socialist movement has had all sorts of divisions, and when it comes to uh, looking for leaders or uh, those who speak for the future, you, know, you can learn from Marx's analysis of uh, capitalist society, the various tendencies in capitalism. Uh, if you don't, you're a fool. Capitalists learn uh, from uh, uh, Marx. Uh, if if uh, socialists don't, they are the more foolish. Okay. All right. I'm next. Yay! Uh, I'm next. Uh, yeah, I've got some homemade stuff. <laughs> I find it somewhat strangely ironic 
in this in this uh, speaker mess of uh, and then you so still owe me, right? Socialists and everybody you here. You still owe me, right? What? I kind of find it really ironic that money? we're all talking about things yeah, like oh, yes. Trump. Yeah, you you have you forgot. Right here, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just, I find I'm it so kind cool. of highly <laughs> ironic. Uh, I just want to fresh one in. The thing is, the plug is uh, All right. Thank you, sweetheart. I appreciate it. Oh, so so anyway, I'm loud enough. What I find highly ironic for you is how fast you guys are in condemning this whole capitalistic system when the data has clearly stated that over the last 300 years mankind as a whole has advanced not only economically and socially but also I think morally. I have found that when the spread of freedom goes, goes throughout the world and there is a chance that free markets reign and dominate with appropriate governmental regulation against fraud and corruption, we are a much better off society. It has been predicted by one of the Gates Foundation reports that within 15 years there will be an end to abject dollar a day poverty around the world. Why? Because people like Let's just say uh, Rockefeller. He is a super rich guy, but you know what else he did? He got the oil lamps out to illuminate the night. He brought cheap oil to the masses so that they can illuminate the night. Look at people like James Pierpont Morgan. It wasn't Edison that directed the, the nationalization of the electrical grid but the financing that J.P. Morgan brought to bring electrification to the masses. And what? he did. He, lost he brought, he may have lost money, but he brought in electrification to the masses because I saw a business opportunity. If it wasn't for people like Bill Gates, who started the computer revolution and brought the PC to the masses, we might not see this internet. Now, granted, there was a lot of government research behind that Internet, DARPA, and a lot of other things. But let's just say, what has been the major economic driver since the end of World War II? That's where you've had government research and private companies coming in, driving innovation, people taking risks, going bankrupt, and some of them winning quite substantially. There is a way that you might want to say sometimes the inequality might just be a resplendent deal where real change happens. You know, when a guy can take a risk and build a large company on an idea, get people together, it's not an easy thing to do. And when you're talking about your political movements, sometimes you just have to get somebody who can talk well, speak well, and make sure it's good. For example, let's just say when you have a lot of excessive government spending like we did in the 70s, it was Britain that led the revolution for privatization. Sir Edmund Heath was a guy who had a pamphlet called The Humanity of Capitalism. I'd suggest you all read it because it really does bring the case out for a good free market, free capitalist society. Not the way we see a lot of corporate nations do today where they're asking for government handouts. I am against not only regular welfare, I do know we do have to have things like unemployment insurance and health care and other things just to keep the citizens going, but what is a real travesty is when we see things like corporate welfare. A Walmart comes into a major city and demands all these concessions because, oh, we're bringing in jobs. Pay your way like everybody else does. That small business, that large business, pay your taxes like everybody else does. Don't go for special consideration. Because you know what's the hard thing about it? These guys come in, these large companies, they create big barriers to entry for smaller companies to come in. To do what? To restrict competition. And when you do so, 
you find that things go a little crazy. For example, even right now, if you look in the computer software development, there's a little development called Linux and the Linux kernel that's a free operating system. Open Office, which is uh, originally designed by Oracle, you can get it for free and still have as just as good a computer as you would with Windows or other things. The reason why Windows works is because it was the first and it was the first to market. We go back into something that even now is a movement that I've only been involved with for the last three years. And it's starting to gain some popularity because it does make some sense. It's taking the traditional nuclear power model, putting it on its head with a little bit of innovation and newer types of reactors can really solve the energy and global warming problem through something called the molten salt thorium reactor. We're going to be hearing a lot about that on the 18th. The bottom line I want to say is this. If you guys think that you're going to bring some kind of utopian view by having everybody equal in society, it just ain't going to work. What we found is that when you have the freedom of movement, the freedom of travel, clear property rights, and the rule of law with a little bit of freedom, you're going to find your society a much better place to live than any other that I've seen around the world. Yes, the United States has its problems, but I still think we are the beacon to the world, the light of the way to show the way the world can work, right. and of course, God bless America, and God bless capitalism. Amen. Is the lovely young lady going to speak, or is it going to be age before beauty? No, I will listen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the oldest one here, so I might as well go. All right, you're next. I don't know where to start, and I don't know where to finish. I know where I am, but I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> I think I know where I am. But with the good friends here, you know, I want to say one thing that just came to my mind over here, that, uh, you know, in this country, I learned when I was, like, 15, 14 years old, growing up in the old Greek town there in the slums, Halstead and Harrison, that you can have any opinions you want as long as you don't express them. <laughs> and this is the last sanctuary of free speech probably in the whole United States where I can say all kinds of crazy, outrageous things and antagonize everybody. Jake. And feel free to come back next week again with us. Here, you know, here's a guy out there, the crazy... I appreciate it. Right wing guy. I saw him out there, but he's not here. I wish Charlie Paydock would bring him back in. I want that I want that guy to hear what I'm gonna say because I want to antagonize him a little more. I don't know his name, but anyway. Maybe I'll antagonize some of you folks here. Well I I've been privileged to be like uh, my good friend here. Pat Butler. I think, Pat, you said about your event. I don't have it in my little book here. I got it in the big book, but I don't remember. Where is it? Uh, oh, yeah, it's not my event. It's uh, the, Dick Simpson's uh, well, event. No, it's so Sultan Library about out the for schools. The, well, you know, that's, your event, uh, yeah, that's, that's occurring. Uh, historical. Uh, that's occurring at the same time. It's sponsored by the Ravenswood Lakeview Historical Association. Right. Uh, I will be emceeing that. And uh, that's at the Sulcer Library at the same time, 7 o'clock next Wednesday. Oh, and Wednesday, next week. Yeah. 7 o'clock the same Sulcer. time, Simpson Great. is doing his thing. You need the microphone to do well, this? Well, yeah, but this is important because, uh, you know, He's I coming here. the Did last event, and I want uh, everybody to know there was a very informative, very stimulating event that you had there at the Sulcer Library. I look forward to it. The and guy's coming to the college. That's okay. That's okay. You don't have to I mean, go there. Hey, I'm a slow learner. You know, I, I had to go twice from law school to make it. I couldn't make it the first time. I announced <laughs> that he's coming here to the okay, college. Okay, hey, wait. Not all of us are smart to remember things like. But you know, here's the thing. Uh, in this country, uh, you know, like Pat Butler said when I was coming in, we don't have to go outside. We got the brains, the brawn, the human, intellectual, spiritual resources to make the best country in the world. And America never was a great nation, unfortunately, starting with the slave owners that made the Constitution until today. But it has the potential to become a great nation. 
it has a human material, human capital, <laughs> physical resources, everything. I mean, there's no society that was better equipped and better qualified to become a great nation. But who can make it a great nation? You've got to forget about the capitalists. Why? Because the capitalists never brought anything good to America. Baloney. Well, it never, it never, was that then? Yes. Okay, I'll give you a read bottle. But you know what? What? Everything that you enjoy, I, I, it took me 77 years to figure that out, by the way. I'm a slow learner. You know, I see the street lights, I see roads, I see schools, I see national defense, I see highways out. In, uh, everything that you see was not done by rich people. It was done by working people. I got a Greek old man, he's about 85 years old, at a coffee house. He says to me, you know, I worked at the Hyatt House by the airport. If it wasn't for those rich people, I would not have a nice house in Lincolnwood. I would not have put my three children through college. And I said to him, Christos, you're wrong. Those rich people that gave you the job did not make you rich. The people that made you rich are the working people, especially working people who fought for their rights, who, like Pastor said, they were people like Compers and other heroic people who made this country what it is. And I said, because you got the money, you did not get it from the rich corporation that owns that big hotel by the airport. You got it from people who made enough money to come in and ten, spend 10, 12, Fifteen dollars to have a nice lunch. Those are the people that made your boss rich and they gave you a comfortable standard of living. But nowadays, no matter how hard you try, you got the system rigged so bad it's worse than slavery. Because in slavery, I said this last time too, I think, see the slave, like in ancient Greece, or I would be a slave because I was a Greek hillbilly from the Appalachian part of Greece. I'd be working in Athens carrying lumber and marble and stones and stuff for the building of the Parthenon and all that. You know what would be happening to me at night? Those rich capitalists who never had it work, like Plato and all those rich guys, they would be sodomizing me at night. They'd be screwing the hell out of me. So now, so those corn borers were the guys, you know, so Greeks don't, hey, you know, I don't associate myself with the modern day Greeks. I associate myself with the classic Greeks. I say, you goddamn Greek hillbilly, like me. I say, in those days, that's what will be happening to you in classical times. Plato and Aristotle and those guys, I never even talked to you. I think you mean Greek Mountain William. Is a politically correct term today. Well, anyway, we learn every day. But so I'm finishing with this. You know, the thing that kills progress in this country, this last hundred years, I've been here almost all, uh, most of that time. I, by the way, I met three statesman lawyers. One statesman lawyer was Abraham Lincoln. I never met him. Second one was Clarence Darrow. He was a statesman lawyer. He died of the year I was born in 38. to do with socials. But, the <laughs> third, but the third statesman lawyer was Alderman Leon Dupre. And he happened to, I went specially, we, I became good friends with Mr. Dupre and uh, Leon Dupre. He was one of the three famous lawyer statesmen of Illinois. Now, Pat Butler might be in our century. Okay. The next statesman. But the thing is, in slavery, you were better off because at the end of your work life, let's say you're not able to work anymore, they would not say, okay, old Black Joe, now we're going to take you out in the woods and we're going to leave you to die because you served us 40, 50 years. Thank you very much, but we don't need you anymore. But old Black Joe, he was able to stay on the plantation. He was able to sit under the nice weeping willow tree and sing uh, religious songs to the grandchildren. And he had a doctor. He had food. And 
Is that cheap? He, he lived the last year. It's, it's, it's eight minutes now. now. I'm finishing. Him. So, the old slaves in ancient Greece or in the American South, they lived their last years in dignity and they died in dignity. Today, they put you out in the street or and you can go and sleep in the park or in the forest preserve and they can carry you out dead with your plastic bags like I saw a few years ago over here by the forest preserve on the north side. So this is worse now than slavery. Yeah, and right. Medicare and Social Security, right? Who's going to save it? It's up to us. You know, we got to take the responsibility. All right, let's thank our speaker again. Now, you wait a minute here. You said these gentlemen were statesmen. I've been dealing in UN affairs for 25 years. Leon Dupre is an alderman in the city. Clarence Darrell, very good lawyer, but he worked just on cases. A statesman is someone who engages in national and international affairs. These are not statesmen. I don't know. They're very good guys, but Next time, work on your list. <laughs> if you want, I'll bring you to a meeting in the United Nations Association. Maybe I could show you some statesmen, but these aldermen are not statesmen. They're nice guys. All right, things I'm going to go over. Uh, let's see. A few things I'll be eclectic as usual. We thank the speaker. Uh, he seems to know all about the activist movement here with, I'm impressed. First of all, Timmy, J.P. Morgan was looking out to monopolize the electricity of the United States. He was insistent upon us using direct current. You mean act It only took current. the actions of Tesla and Westinghouse to stop him. Tesla gave up his patents in order to do so because his capitalist fascist wanted to take it over for his personal profit. He didn't care whether we had light bulbs or not or anything else. He wanted to make money for himself but he so he could buy some the country. more pretty pictures for his mansion on Fifth Avenue in New York City. A much and he more... didn't care if you had a light bulb in your house that worked. He didn't care if we had something called the grid that worked because he was out to control something. That's what capitalists do. And they control things. Why? Because they want to prove they they have those sort of like good values. They want to make money, Charlie. Yes. All right, the other thing is, you mentioned this picture of Lennon. I'll have you know that when they moved the party headquarters, Patrick, I showed up at the Robin sale. They were clearing out, and I purchased that picture of Lennon, and it's in my house. <laughs> Lennon was the eye of the beholder. You know what I mean? These guys were economists. Their their economic theories apply to any country whatsoever, and they are not spe country specific. Uh, granted, they're possibly not in the pantheon of American heroes in the Smithsonian, but nevertheless, they are in the intellectual world. Uh, you know, I guess we could find our own heroes, you know. To, and, you know the other thing is here, um, I'm running many years, I was affiliated with an independent union, and I heard some talk here. I hear, I like this all the time, that something, uh, uh, all those darn business unions. Well, I like being in a business union. You want to know why? Because we go up against businesses. And they have big bureaucracies. And they have big legal departments. And they have big expenses. And guess what? If you're going to meet them, and if you're going to have any chance of success, you're going to have to meet them with a bureaucracy that is equal if not exceeds them. It's like I always say, we have to be better bureaucrats than they are. 
And there are some things of solidarity, and there are situations where I guess that may apply. But like anything, the organized labor movement has to mature and be equitable to what they're going up against. Um, yes, I, I personally don't like the over-legalization that personnel, pol personnel administration has become. But unfortunately, I can't control the world. I can't control the arrangements. It has become more legalistic. Uh, you know, there are some notions that if we're going to return to some idyllic days of some, you know, playing guitars and singing labor songs, um, I enjoy that. I, I'm a student of history, but, you know, how honestly, when you're confronted with today's situations and they come after you, I'm kind of glad that the unions have matured and have, can stand to them and not have to engage in what they can, you know, street actions, ruffianism, what have you. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a different little thing. We had to do that in the beginning, but now, you know, it's a totally different world. And who did who do they, you know, honestly, I, I've had situations where I've had situations, the, the employer will send in a lawyer or two and a personnel specialist or two against me. And that's the team. That's what you're up against. And then you say, okay, let's begin this hearing or negotiations here and things like that. So it levels the playing field. And it does help to have headquarters with some money and some full-time professionals uh, who can give us guidance in, in resolving these situations. Anyhow, thanks a lot. Very good. Yeah. Speaker gets the last well, word. I, Speaker gets the last word. I'm a statesman from Bridgeport. <laughs> Speaker gets the last word. So there's a lot of things that we've talked about, and I'm going to highlight some of those things. Um, this whole movements and activism and community organizing and applying business practices. Um, again, I still feel that is not, cannot apply at all. I think there are certain things, certain marketing, PR, advertising, HR, some of those things can apply, but the overall practices and business cannot work in movements or community organizing because they're two different beasts and one has a different objective over the other. So there's certain things, like I said earlier, certain things can articulate, but again, movement, creating a social movement is experimentation. I guess you can say making a business is experimentation either. Like Hilltop, this is an experiment to do something. It could fail tomorrow. It could. But nonetheless, there's a certain thing and parameters to keep this business going, unlike a movement, because a movement has a certain end. And then once that end is achieved, there's a whole new other end for that. This is a continuation of things. Um, which other gentleman was here? Um, capitalism is utopian. I mean, <laughs> there's like, like socialism and communism, there's certain utopian aspects to it. There's utopian in capitalism with Iran, you know, and Rand, with Hayek. Um, Milton Friedman are also put on a higher pedestal like Marx and Engels, Luxembourg, and all that. Um, you must say the same thing a lot about capitalism because when I was here last year, you talk about capitalism and morality. I'm going to say the exact same thing. 
I don't think slavery is, mor is moral or, hum or human. Nope. And yet, that's a capitalist means in the South, in China with Apple, and everything else. So if you're talking about the morality of capitalism, then they should get a fair wage and, and sweatshops and other things. So there's no morality in capitalism in my eyes. Okay. Um, Bill Gates, he's part of the nonprofit industrial complex. With his amount of money, he can end poverty in Honduras like that. Same way with the Vatican. If the Vatican liquidated every asset that they had. They can provide food, shelter for Central, Central America, South America, and Africa if they wanted to. And on the subject of morality and capitalism, John Mackey, the CEO of Whole Foods, his, he, started as a, he started as a cooperative worker in a food co-op in Texas. And in a Forbes magazine article, he even said that his aim as CEO of Whole Foods is to put out food co-ops out of business. So that's his morality of capitalism, you know. So you go to Whole Foods or Whole Paycheck, and you buy you six items that cost a hundred dollars. What's what's that for? You know. Um, so that's why I don't understand this idea of morality and capitalism because they don't go hand in hand at all. Do I think there's morality in socialism and communism? Um, I don't know because. No one has gave us a chance <laughs> to run the country or city and everything. So I can't say yes or no, and I can't say, you know, about Russia because I didn't live there. I, have, I don't. I haven't lived in Cuba and stuff like that. I only know the United States. And if you maybe give socialism a chance to run a democratic socialist approach, then maybe we can probably see the morality of socialism as a philosophy. Um, but I do want to end about social movements and just to say um, it takes a group and to retain a social movement you have to maintain the aims of your goals. That's the only way to do it. If you just retain that Keep at what you're doing and not be distracted by other things. And listen to the people that are involved in your movement. Then your movement could be successful. If it doesn't, that's fine. Start all over again. Because the one thing I don't like is when a movement happens, like, we're done. It failed. And people move on. Okay, let's just keep at it. It didn't work this time. Let's go a different way or another way. That's all there is to it. I mean, just because something never moved forward doesn't mean it's done. Because for some of us, we're still keeping at it, even though some of our movements have deceased. We're still involved in other things. I encourage you all to get involved in movements, no matter what capacity you're in. Thank you for having me be here, and I'll see you guys next time. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right.